Please rewind this cassette. Does anyone remember Garden State, Zach Braff's cinematic masterpiece? You know, at the time, this was a really popular movie with young people, particularly teenagers and people in their 20s. I remember loving this movie the first time I saw it. It had a big impact on me. Many people said it was the graduate for my generation. You know, with how great Scrubs was and his directorial debut, it seemed like Zach Braff was going to have a very fruitful career. Now in retrospect, Garden State hasn't aged very well at all. Don't get me wrong, there's still some really good scenes, there's some really nice comedic moments, the performances aren't bad, Peter Sarsgaard is actually kind of great in the movie. But now it's just like a cringe fest with a great soundtrack. However, I have a different take on this movie, an interpretation that came to me recently. Garden State, as I see it, is secretly a horror film. Let's just think about this for a second, okay? The movie starts with a dream sequence. Zach Braff is on an airplane that is clearly going to crash. Everyone around him is in a total panic, but he sits there, very calmly, almost like a psychopath. Now, at the time, you just take this as, oh, well, he feels like he is out of touch. He can't connect with what's going on around him. It's symbolic for the character and where he's at in his life. Sure, there's this tragedy going on around him, and everyone is very emotional, but he just can't give a damn. Death doesn't mean anything because life doesn't mean anything. I don't see it this way anymore. I actually think that he's the reason the plane is going to crash. Like, he did something to the plane, and he's sitting there watching his plan unfold. He wakes up, we find out that he's an actor in L.A., well, a struggling actor who played a retarded guy on a TV movie one time. Now he has to go back home after the death of his mother. He hasn't been home in years after a tragic incident in his youth, and he's been on medication for a long time given to him by his father. The mystery behind all of this doesn't unfold until the second half of the movie. Early on, we start to get David Lynchian-like scenes, especially this party montage scene, and then the next day a guy shows up in a knight costume while he's in armor. I think this is Jim Parsons? Now picture this scene in a horror movie. I'm just saying. Let's dig a little deeper, shall we? So after he starts rekindling his friendships with his friends, of course the great Peter Skarsgård, the best part of this movie, he meets a girl. Not just any girl, though, but Natalie Portman in one of the most insane roles ever. Like, what the fuck is with this character? She is everything that is wrong with this kind of character, and maybe this kind of person in real life. She asks him to listen to a song on her headphones. She says the song will change your life. Who the fuck says stuff like that except a hipster or a psychopath? Now, he puts the headphones on and sure, what we hear is the shins and it's some indie music that was popular at the time. The whole soundtrack is filled with this stuff. But I have a different interpretation. I think this was some kind of ritual. Let's, uh, let's change the audio on this just to, just to get my point across. good i like it eventually he goes over to her house now this is a really creepy scene and sure it's played up as a quirky romantic moment but this is honestly one of the most terrifying scenes ever committed to film she lives like in the middle of nowhere there's a graveyard for animals she takes him into her bedroom and she says sometimes i do this and then she starts like contorting her body and making weird noises and doing stuff with her hands now this is supposed to be funny because zach braff's trying to make a quirky indie movie but really think about if this happened in real life i would be so fucking scared if some girl did this to me this is horrifying it's like she's been possessed by a demon and she's demonstrating it in front of him I mean, I would be worried she's gonna pull a knife out and stab me in the fucking chest. Hey, you fucking can't! What are you, what are you gonna fucking stab me? You might think I'm being hyperbolic, but really, if I was sitting on the edge of a bed and some chick was doing that in front of me, I would be fucking horrified. There's nothing that isn't scary about this. So, what does this mean? Well, I take it as these are two crazy people that have now fallen in love. Their shared passion for, well, death. As the movie goes on... We start to discover that there was an accident when Braff was a kid, something with his mother, that he possibly pushed her down some stairs. Okay, so he tried to kill his mom, <laughs> he comes back, 
after she is dead at her funeral, I think in the way many serial killers do, he comes back to the town to see his victim. He may have not been able to get her in the past, but God got her, or Satan. And isn't it just wonderful that he meets another crazy person to share this victory with? There's one scene now that is really infamous where they find just a giant pit where this scientist guy is in a trailer with his wife. This is like some cosmic horror shit. And Braff says to the guy at one point before they leave, enjoy looking into the infinite abyss or something like that. And then the guy says back to Braff, you too. I can't even set through this scene now. This is the cringiest shit I've ever seen. But really, what is that though? Look into the infinite abyss. So I may call it just a crappy hipster film that's trying to say something profound, but there's really nothing there. He's trying to make 20-somethings relate to him. I don't look at it that way. I really think this is Lovecraftian. So they go up like a bunch of crazy people, stand up on this piece of machinery, and just start screaming into this giant infinite hole of abyss. Now tell me, normal people don't do this. What does this scene represent? Are they letting out their frustrations and just saying, fuck it all? No, no, this is, this is a moment of, of just pure psycho. This is them screaming out like crazy people and saying like, Oh, look at me roar! Fuck the world! There's even this awkward moment where Peter Skarsgård looks over while they're kissing and he's like, Jesus Christ, dude, did you just write this movie so you could make out with Natalie Portman? God damn, this movie's aged poorly. And Zach Braff's works that came after this just confirm his hack status. Not only is he a fug beast, he's about as pretentious as a young artist can get. There's also some weird creepy scene where a guy's shooting arrows up in the air and they're going to fall down. I think arrows that are on fire and they're going to hit both Natalie Portman or Zach Braff and they're running back and forth. Once again, quirky indie scene or something terrifying. I mean, imagine if that was happening in real life. So then Peter Skarsgård gives the necklace that belonged to Zach Braff's mother to him, which I guess he grabbed before they put her body in the ground. So this is like the serial killer getting some kind of item to remember his victim. Of course Zach wanted it. I mean, he hated his mother. He tried to kill her for fuck's sakes. He's on medication because he's a fucking insane person. So now everything loops back around. We're at the airport. He's going to go back to LA, say he's going to come back. Now, I don't know if this is supposed to tie into the opening scene. Like if he gets on this plane, it's going to crash. Is this some final destination shit? But he decides against it, runs back in the most romantic scene of the 2000s, grabs Natalie Portman, and tells her all that stuff he was saying was stupid. And that he loves her and he has to figure a lot of shit out, but all he knows is that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. Now, you could see this as a very romantic moment, one that's sweet, him deciding that I have to do something with my life. I take it as that this is some kind of Sid and Nancy thing. Or even worse, this is like Chucky and his wife. He finds someone else just as crazy as him. I think he realizes this during the bathtub scene. And he's like, I can't leave this. Listen, if I go out to LA, I'm just another crazy guy. You know, an actor. They're all crazy. But here, I can be crazy with her. We can just be two crazy people. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do? Now, what do we do could mean, what do we do with the rest of our lives? How do we deal with all the pressure and the struggles that we go through? Is there any respite to the pain that we can't deal with getting up in the morning, that life is just a struggle, that it's just hard to do things that for most people are effortless? No, I take this as what do we do next? Who are we going to kill next? Who are we going to take out? I think he's going to go kill Peter Sarsgaard, who's just doing bong hits at the end of the movie. Now, of course, this video is playful. I don't actually think Garden State is a horror movie. I don't think Zach Braff was intending for it to come across that way. And if anything, it's scary in ways that aren't directly horror related, but just scary in the fact that I used to like this movie and it says a lot about me at 14. Great soundtrack, though, really. But still, I always thought this would be a fun idea, like maybe this would be a better movie that did hold up better if it was a horror film. He goes back to his hometown and everybody is an eccentric. Like I said, it's very David Lynchy, and let's look at this town like if it was Twin Peaks. We find out the secret backstory that he may have been involved with harming his mother and his father had to send him away and medicate him to protect himself and the mother. And now he's come back and he meets someone else that is also crazy and together they're going to team up to take over the world. I like this a lot better because the movie that exists now is just a mesh of tones and ideas that are really ridiculous and obvious. Clearly he read Catcher in the Rye, he really liked Salinger, and he was like, I'm gonna do that kind of stuff. I like The Graduate. 
I guess every generation has its graduate clone, and I suppose Garden State had to be the one. I like this movie in pieces. I like parts of this movie. It's not all bad. It hasn't all aged poorly, but really think about where you were at when you first saw Garden State and then try to watch it now. Great soundtrack, though. So what is Garden State? Is it just a state? A place? Something that we can go to? Is it an idea? Is it a metaphor? I guess it can be anything and everything. I take it, though, as a look into the psyche of troubled individuals. Those who can't fit in, those who don't relate to others, those who don't have empathy, those who don't share basic human emotions. You know, like a psychopath. Now, sure, Garden State could be about the vapid nature of L.A. and how Zach Braff feels like he himself needs to escape this and go back to his roots and discover why he wanted to be an artist in the first place. But maybe, deep down, there's something to take from Garden State. Something scarier. Something that lingers a little bit more. That there are people out there like this. That there are women out there like Natalie Portman. Mostly bipolar girls that you fuck a few times and then you find out how crazy she is. But as the movie says, what do we do? How do I move on from this movie? As much as I hate it, I can't seem to forget it. I can't let it go. It's such a big part of my growth into loving cinema. Did I just grow past it? Did I just get too old for it? Did my taste just change too much? Was it just a product of its time? Maybe it's all the above or maybe it's nothing. But I ask you. No, damn it, I beg you. Please, look into the infinite abyss, the darkness in Zach Braff's eyes, and you'll see his true intentions. This isn't a man. This is a monster. This is a monster. 